Wow, we have looked at the book of Revelation. What a, what a powerful study. What a powerful study of what God is doing at the end of this age. And this is his love letter to the church. I call it his love letter because it's his action plan. It's his way of defining what is going to happen in the latter days, in the last days. And by the way, the last days started at, the, at Pentecost. If you go in the book of Acts, chapter 2, he calls it the last days. So we have been in the last days ever since Pentecost. The church has always been expectant of the return of Christ from the time of Pentecost. They've looked forward to it. It's called the blessed hope. The hope of the church. Not that we'll just get out of here, but watch it. But that Jesus Christ is physically going to possess the earth. That what was God's original intention in Genesis is going to be completely fulfilled by Jesus Christ. And he shall reign and we shall reign with him. Look at Revelation chapter of, of 1. Mentions it twice in Revelation. He has made us a kingdom of kings and priests unto our God. Say, I am a king and a priest. And we shall reign on earth. That's what it says in Revelation 1, not in heaven. See, some people have this idea that uh, we're just all going to just get raptured out of here and hang out in heaven for the rest of eternity. That couldn't be further from the truth. God has already always had a plan for planet earth. He has a plan for the end of this age. He has a plan for the millennium. He has a plan for eternity. The heaven's going to be joined to earth. There's going to be a 1,500 square mile new bride to send out of heaven above this earth. And this earth and, and the uh, bride are going to be operating together. So it's going to be a beautiful relationship. And God has a design, a purpose. So don't just think you're just going to get raptured out of here someday. And it's just, a, in fact, we're going to find here that the rapture and, and the second coming of Christ is a lot like Israel leaving Egypt. It happened over a process of time. It wasn't just overnight. It took a lot of time. The Egyptians gave the gold to the Israelites. There was a preparation time. And then it, Israel did not possess the land overnight. Now, doesn't, we're not going to have a delay of 40 years. We're going to see it's going to happen quickly at the end of this age. But it took time for Joshua to conquer the land. It's going to take time for Jesus to bring, watch this, to bring the kingdoms of this world under his rulership. You don't just don't pop down on earth and happen overnight. There's going to be a transition of what? 232, approximately 232 nations under the rulership of Jesus? That's, that's, you don't do that overnight. Just to transition one government alone takes a lot of time. So this is a process, as we're going to see today, this does not happen immediately. I, 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 you know, Hal Lindsey did a book way back when, the late great planet Earth, and just said we're all just going to get taken out of here. And then Tim LaHaye, which was my friend, by the way, I spoke in his college at an opening week of campus out there. He invited me out, and years ago I, I was his keynote speaker for his university out there. And uh, Tim LaHaye and I went to lunch, and I'll never forget what Tim LaHaye said. He said, you know what? He said, I, I am over, he shared a little bit of his personal, he doesn't mind me sharing this. Uh, he said, I am over $350,000 in debt. He said, I made some bad investments, did, made some mistakes, and he said, I don't know that I'll ever be able to pay off that debt. How much did he make on the series? <laughs> millions of dollars, he made millions of dollars. So don't ever say it's impossible. I still remember we sat by the ocean in that restaurant. And he kind of was very sad. He said, Jerry, I don't think I'll ever be able to pay off my debt. But look at him, how God blessed him. So don't ever say that. Don't ever say you're never able. Because with God, things, all things are what? With God, all things are possible. All right. Wow, this is the seventh trumpet today. Let's go to Revelation, if you will. And take your Bibles right now. And I got my good word of God here. Like I said last week, I appreciate the internet and I appreciate my iPads and all that. But I like holding the Word in my hand. Amen? I just like the physical Word of God. Just, I don't know, I just feel like it's special to have the physical Word. How are you today, brother? Good to see you. By the way, I went through your videos, I mean, your 
clipper that you gave me, and we'll talk afterward. We got a good course coming up on some very foundational things for the university. We've been looking forward to a course that would really teach us uh, apologetics. And so our good brother is coming out and getting in tune with us here, and he's going to be teaching later this summer. Um, an apologetics course. It's going to be very, very good. He's uh, Bert. Remember Bert last week? Bert, the ICM fellow that they build churches all over the world, over 12,000 churches. He brought and introduced my good brother to me, and, and this is beautiful. All right, now we have actually two mentions of the seventh trumpet. One is in chapter 10, and one is in chapter 11. And we're going to look at these because uh, in your, in your uh, notes, first of all, put measurement. The measurement of time is revealed. God gives us a time frame in which the seventh trumpet blows. In my opinion, this is the most important section in all of Revelation, and I'll tell you why. And we're going to read the verses behind it. Look at it in chapter 10, verse, uh, verse 6. Uh, and swore to him by, uh, who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, and the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, and there shall be, shall be say it with me, be delay no longer. This is the completion of the mystery of God. We're going to look at that in the next section. But the days of the sounding of the seventh angel... When he is about to sound, watch these next phrases. The mystery of God would be finished, complete. The mystery of God is going to be complete. And as he declared to his servants, the prophets. Now we're going to look at one of the main prophets that declared the mystery of God. In fact, it was such a mystery to Daniel that he was told to what? seal up the book and keep it for the time of the end. He was told to seal up the book, not to reveal all of it. But what does Jesus break open? Seven seals. What was hidden in the book of Daniel is now revealed. So we're going to look a bit at the book of Daniel because God did give Daniel a timeline. In fact, there are three timelines in Daniel. We want to look at these. Uh, the day of the Lord is a term of the seven-year tribulation period, but the only great tribulation is the last three and a half years. The first part of the tribulation, the, the, the earth is going to look amazing. We have a man arriving called the Antichrist. He comes with a big peace agreement. It looks like he solves all the problems of the world. He unites the churches of the world. He unites the governments of the world. He unites the economy of the world, the banks of the world. And he puts it all together. And he looks like... How many know the earth is ready for an antichrist right now? There's so much turmoil out there. If somebody stepped up and said legitimately that they had the authority because the antichrist is going to be given power for one hour. That's what Daniel says. He's even going to subdue the saints for a period of time, but not for long. So whatever the Antichrist done is not going to be lived long. Now, opening the seals, let's review. We looked at the four horsemen of the apocalypse, right? So first of all is the white horse, which is the Antichrist, tries to look like Jesus, comes back with a peace agreement. Then we have the red horse, which is what? War. So it's not long after the Antichrist takes control of the earth, he will be a worldwide leader. He will control all the economy, the governments of the world. They're all going to come under his authority, and God allows this. You know why? Because God is setting up Satan for exposure, for a fall. <laughs> The Antichrist, uh, I, I've said it so many times, it's Satan's last attempt to take possession of planet Earth. Well, we know already has it. In fact, what we read here, him who made the sea, the heavens, the, the land, the, you know, Jesus created it all. He has the original ownership rights. He holds the patent rights to the universe. All things are created by him and for him, and without him was nothing made, and it's in the book of Colossians. And he's before all things, and by him all things are held together. I give this, I love Colossians. It's my favorite book of the Bible. Because when I was a junior high kid, I went up in the mountains of Colorado with Beth Eden Baptist Church for a week of study. And as a junior high camp, 
I was thinking this week, how, how come we don't have more camps anymore like we used to? How many went to camps when you were younger? Did you all go to camps? I was in Bible camp every year. I, do you still go or? Uh, no, I, I know some are. Some are still doing camps. I, I tell you, I made tremendous decisions. God called me to the ministry at a camp, at a Bible camp, at the Grace Bible Institute Quartet. I still see the old oak tree that I sat under and the baritone of the quartet. I was just weeping like crazy. God was dealing with me. I was 12 years old. I'd been through a tractor accident on the farm. I'd been spared spinal meningitis when I was young. I was supposed to die. And, and, and God just reminded me I wasn't my own. And under that big oak tree with that baritone of the quartet, he prayed with me and I committed my life to, to full-time ministry. And, uh, you know, by the way, my whole concept of full-time ministry has changed. We're all now in full-time ministry. If you're a believer, you're in full-time ministry. Are you part-time? Your occupation is just to support your ministry. That's why you got a job. It's to support your ministry. Because you're ministering full-time. Why? Because you're the living kingdom of God. So we have this beautiful timeline here out of the book of Daniel. Now there are three timelines in Daniel. I don't want to spend a lot of time there. We have too much to cover. There are three timelines in Daniel. In Daniel chapter 7, he calls it time, times, and half a time. Now that time, times, and half a time in Daniel chapter 7 is each year is a time. So there's one time, then there's two times, which is three, right? One and, what's one plus two? Three, three thank you. <laughs> so time is one year, times is two years, and half a times is, is what? Half a year. So this is called, it's, it, it shows the first timeline, which by the way, all the timelines of Daniel begin with something called the abomination of desolation. There are marker points in prophecy that are definite signs that things begin to happen in a sequence following that. And Daniel talks about the abomination of desolation three times. So one timeline says three and a half years. How many days is that? 1260 days. So one timeline is what? 1260 days, right? Then the next timeline is found in Daniel chapter 12. He says, after the abomination of days, there is 1290 days. What's that? He just talked about 1260 days in Daniel chapter 7. Now he's talking about 1290 days. He gives that actually in Daniel. Let's, if you want, you can turn there in Daniel 12. It, it, he actually says he gives it 1290 days. And then he adds a third timeline. 1,335 days. So now you've got three timelines from the abomination of desolation till the end of all days. So this is really interesting and fun to study. So it's just not three and a half years after the abomination of desolation. It's three timelines. One 1260, one 1290, one 1335. So those are, did I put 36 up there? I'm stretching it a year. I don't know where I got that. I must have hit the wrong key on my keyboard. All right, it's 335 days. Now let's, we're gonna study this and see what these really represent. So the beginning of sorrows is the first three and a half years of the tribulation. Matthew talked about that in Matthew 24. By the way, there's Luke 13, or Luke 21, Matthew 24, these are all uh, timelines as well. Matthew 24 is just like the book of Revelation, if you study it. I've got a good study on that. Go to my uh, YouTube channel and look up Matthew 24 because it correlates exactly the timeline of, of the tribulation. And by the way, the coming of the Lord in Matthew 24 is after the tribulation. The coming of the Lord, it says in Matthew 24, after the great tribulation, these things will. So the timeline of tw Matthew 24 is one of the great arguments. Now, what, what is the rapture of the church? 
It's part of the second coming of Christ. How do we separate these out? How do we go to Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, John's caught up into heaven and we think it's the church? Why do, we, why do we think the church is caught up? Because John's caught up. I don't know. We just assumed that. Yeah, get the extra sheets, study sheets there. Yeah, to anybody. Everybody have a study sheet? Uh, pick those up, Trevor, and go around to the back there. All right. I'm sorry. I should have printed more here. We Everybody have one? All right. Sorry about the interruption here. But yeah, make sure everybody has a study sheet. So the first point is the measurement of time is revealed. And this is the time. So the rapture of the church, I believe, and we're going to look at this, why I believe this. The bride of Christ is going to be called up at the 1260 period. Now, we're going to be a part of the transition of this earth's kingdoms between 1260 and 1335. I believe Jesus is going to come back through Jordan. I'm going to give some reasons behind that. He's just not going to descend on Mount of Olives. It's all over. He's going to come back through Jordan and he's going to conquer Israel with the, with the saints. Hello, say, I'm going to be there. Oh. Called the Battle of Armageddon. I'm going to be there to see the transition happen for Jerusalem. So we have these timelines. You've got to study this a little bit, and I've spent a lot of time studying this, believe me. And so we have the 1260 days, which I believe is the rapture of the church. Then we have the end of the abomination, which is 1290 days. And then we have the transition to, of the kingdoms, 1290 to 1335 days. And that's why Daniel couldn't quite understand these timelines. When God gave him the timelines, he, God told him, seal up the book until the time of the end. You won't understand this. So now we do understand. Don't we have an exciting day? Is this, see, remember what we read? That, that it was declared to his servants, the prophets. The mystery of God. By the way, we are part of the mystery of God. Do you know you're called, the bride of Christ is called the mystery? Even angels are understanding redemption through you. They don't understand the blood of power, the blood of Jesus. They have to watch you. Isn't that amazing that the bride can unveil to angels the mystery? It's called the mystery of God. That's powerful. There's some exciting things. I don't know if you get excited as I do, but you're part of that mystery. And what is the end of that mystery? It's the finishing of that nine, 1290 days. It says the mystery of God is over. It's the blowing of the seventh trumpet. Now, let's go to the book of, of uh, Revelation chapter 12. Or chapter 11. All right, chapter 11. And we see here some amazing things. At the end of that... Well, let's, let's step back a minute. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. So the time of great tribulation. Now watch this. The time of great tribulation begins with the abomination of desolation. What is the abomination of desolation? Anybody know what that is? What happens at the abomination of desolation? The Antichrist does what? He goes into the temple, sets up a God, a, a, an idol of himself, and says, yeah, I let you rebuild the temple. I believe the Antichrist is even going to help Israel rebuild the temple. I believe he assists them in doing that. I don't know if he has in mind at the beginning of that temple, because he's going to allow them to do, begin sacrificing. I showed you pictures of the high priesthood, and, and Israel is beginning to practice the sacrificial lamb. They're already sacrificing lambs on portable altars. And, and so the temple is going to be rebuilt. The Jewish priesthood is going to be reestablished and they're going to offer sacrifices again on an altar God allows this as part of the Orthodox Jewish they they're still believing in that they don't believe the Messiah's come yet but at the abomination of desolation a tremendous persecution happens I believe that's the war that's when war breaks out. I think the first three and a half years is the Antichrist sets things up, rules the world. People think, wow, this is the best thing since 
spill, sliced bread and <laughs> you know, the world's going to bow at his feet. But at the middle of the tribulation, he's going to turn and he's going to bring war. Now, some believe Ezekiel 37 and 38 is that war. It's the surrounding of Israel of all the Arab nations that attack it, along with Russia from the north. We may do a study on Ezekiel 38. What they do is they surround... Does that look possible today? Does that, have you watched the news lately? Of all the nations rising up against Israel... They surround the, the, the nation Israel. So we see this in the early stages. It's, it's all getting set up. I'll tell you, if you read the book of Revelation, no wonder the Bible says, he that reads and understands this book is blessed. Because it gives you a perspective on what's going on. So Israel is going to be safe in the land. When they say peace and safety, then what? Sudden destruction is going to come on them. Israel's going to be dwelling safely in the land with the Antichrist. He's made a covenant with Israel. He's allowed them to build the temple. Just to remind you again, I was in the Temple Institute when we went over. Uh, Robert, uh, that used to t attend class here years ago, now he's moved back to Lakeland. But he and I were together over there, and we went into the Temple Institute. All the articles of the Temple in are in the Temple Institute. The uh, lampstand, the altar of incense, all of that. It's sitting there waiting. We asked the high priest, how quickly could these articles be moved into a temple if it was rebuilt? He said 30 days we could fully outfit the temple. So it wouldn't take long for the Antichrist to set up, uh, allow Israel to build the temple and then set it up and it'd be occupied and they began the sacrifices. But in middle of the tribulation, the Antichrist marches in and said, it's over. Your daily sacrifices are over. No more lambs, no more bullocks, no more goats. You're going to worship me. I am God. That's what the Antichrist is going to say. And this altar actually supernaturally speaks. This idol that he sets up to himself speaks. Signs and wonders accompany some things that the Antichrist does. And he deceives the nations. So you got to be ready for this. So we understand the timeline. It's the time of the end. And uh, the bride of Christ will be raptured and, and, and circle the earth. I believe we spend that first 30 days circling the earth. But uh, 12, uh, 160 days to 1290 days. I believe we're going to go, go around. You know why? Because every eye will see him. Every tribe, every tongue, every nation is going to witness Jesus coming, returning in the clouds. How can they do that? You say, well, they watch CNN or whatever, <laughs> Fox News. No, no, they're going to physically see him. And, and I believe God is continuing to give opportunity for the nations to repent. God's grace. If you read the end of the book of Revelation, God says, if you're thirsty, come. He's inviting man all through this. You say, well, why the judgments? I've mentioned it. You're going to get this after all this teaching. The judgments are to purify the earth for the rulership and reign of Christ. Just like Noah had, in the days of Noah, they had to purify the earth with water. Here they purify. Look at last week at the first six trumpets. Did you see that? Remember the video I played? All the fire falling on the earth, the wormwood falls, the, the hails of fire and, and, and uh, stone fall on the earth. Some of the uh, hails, stones are as large as 100 pounds. I mean, this is major judgment coming. All the grass of the earth is burned up in this invasion of these fiery things from outer space, or some believe they may, may be from volcanoes because of the earthquake that happens. All we know is God's going to be purging this earth with fire. There's one reason, because he's cleansing the earth for his rulership. Secondly, he's bringing every man, woman, and child to a point of decision. There'll be no neutrality in the, the tribulation period. You will have cho chosen, taken sides. And if God is just, shouldn't he give every man? The 144,000 are released to the nations. I, I believe they're going to receive the gift of tongues. They're going to be able to speak the dialects that we're trying to reach. They'll be able to march into a village and speak that language of that village. We know that happens. 
Because Revelation 7, 9 says, John had a vision at the end. He saw every tribe, tongue, and dialect represented in, in a numerable company around the throne. So this, I hope we're getting a picture of what's going on. So number one, the measurement of time is revealed. Number two, the mystery of God is completed. Now let's read it again in Revelation 10, okay? In the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished. That's you and I. That's another argument, I believe, for the church to be raptured. The ending of this mystery is going to be us being caught up to be with Jesus. We're going to be with him. Finished just as he declared in, but to his servants, the prophets. So if you look at all the Old Testament scriptures, everything I'm saying, you study it out. Like the Bereans, be better than just saying, yeah, Jerry's right. Go home and study the scriptures to see if what I'm saying is true. I believe it really is. And by the way, I was a traditional dispensationalist and pre-tribulation rapture guy because that's what I was taught at college and seminary. And I was proud of it. <laughs> and you know, I thought I had so many books, I'd buy every book I knew I could own. I love books. And so I used to study and read, but God straightened me out. You say, well, I, I still am pre-trib, that's fine. That's fine. You're, you're, stay with it if you, that's what you want to believe, that's okay. It's not a matter of fellowship. Hello. It's not a matter of fellowship. Marianne, my wife, is pre-trib. I said, it's okay. I think she just wants to get out. <laughs> she, it's so simple. This whole, this whole pre-trib thing is so simple. It's just an uh, overnight solution. Jesus comes in the clouds, we meet him in the air, and we get off this earth, and you never hear about any transition. We're just going to be with Jesus up there on some cloud or something. I guess we're going to have a seven-year meal or something called the... Uh, uh, <laughs> Bride of Christ has a seven-year feast uh, up there in heaven. I mean, that's kind of what I used to teach. And so, you know, it's not that way. When you really understand Jesus coming back to possess this earth, it takes some time to reorient all the kingdoms, as we're going to see at the end of this chapter, to re reorient all the kingdoms of this world under his rulership. The kingdoms of this world shall become the what? The kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. That's the end of the chapter 11, the result. And so uh, we got to realize that this earth was designed originally to be dominated. Why did God make Adam and Eve in his own image? To take what? Dominion. His intent has always been dominion. But we know who stepped in. The old devil came along and deceived. And man lost that dominion. And the whole journey for thousands of years, now 6,000 years, this whole journey since the creation of man has been trying to take back that dominion. Now, my theology, I believe in dominion theology. I believe that we're called to be kings and priests. And Satan is not the god of this world. Is he your god? Are you in this world? He's not the god of this world. He's the god of the Babylonian system. We're going to look at that in Revelation 18 later. It's a very interesting system. And that system is falling into place right now. Beginning to happen with the collapse of the U.S. dollar. I taught that eight years ago. I said someday the U.S. dollar is going to lose its value. You watch, and there'll be a global there'll be a global currency. My opinion. I'm going to get political here a minute. You do what you want. I, I have the right. See, I got the mic right. I think Biden would. Excuse me. I think Biden was absolutely stupid to put these sanctions on Russia and destroy what 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 America had. Those sanctions resulted in all the nations taking sides. And so now we got China and Russia, Brazil, what? India, all siding against us. How crazy can you get? Boy, we've had bad leadership. The only hope for America, if there's any kind of delay in what's coming, is, is we get new good leadership in this nation. And I, you know, God says pray for the king, so I, I pray for him every day. 
Uh, <laughs> you know, I pray for Biden and, okay, I, I pray that somehow get his mind back and, and figure out what's, what's good for our nation. But I'm just saying, praise God. But could God be allowing some things to happen to align us for the end times? I don't know. I'm sitting at this prayer luncheon the other day where I was asked to come and pray for, for uh, evangelism. And across the table from me is a lady from Don, uh, Tom's church, Tom Atchison, and she's part of the women's home down there. And she's, uh, I, I can tell that she has some mental issues. But the woman was talking so much sense, I said, this woman has more common sense than most people. And she says, Jerry, I, I have a question for you. I said, oh, okay. She says, if I understand Revelation, we're trying to pray that revelation can't ha won't happen on this earth. <laughs> she said, how do, we, what, how do I pray? How do I pray against the Antichrist if he's going to be revealed and, and, and fulfill prophecy? I said, well, pray that he won't have the authority over believers, that believers will choose to stand in that day because, watch this, one reason God released Satan on this earth, and God allowed Satan... God didn't create him, but he threw him out of heaven. But God allowed him because this has been a battle zone for 6,000 years. You know why? To build us up in the faith. To make us more than conquerors. Right? Imagine if you were a football team and it didn't have any opponent. You just went down the field throwing the ball back and forth and nobody else on the field but you, you know. Nobody would be going. There'd be two people sitting in the stands. No, we go out there. We go, mm, you know, I like that stuff too, you know. <laughs> and uh, we just, there's something about us that we, we, you know, and I'm a warrior at heart. I've been in spiritual warfare. That's why I went to the streets of San Francisco. Come on. How many have been in a battle here? How many have been in this 6,000 year journey of trying to overcome the Antichrist, trying to overcome the devil? And by the way, good news. We looked last week that the altar of incense in heaven, and this is a big angel. This altar of incense is gathering the prayers of the saints, which have been gathered by the 24 elders, the bowls. And they take the prayers out of those bowls, and he, the 24 elders bring them over to this big angel, and he takes them and casts them like incense on the altar and then he takes the, the, the prayers and casts them to the earth. And that's when the fires break out. That's when the seals get open. So don't quit praying. Your prayers are being heard. God's purpose is being fulfilled. Pray that the church would be an overcoming church at the end of this age and that God is preparing us to reign with Him. Now, you were in the military, uh, Holly, and, and there was called boot camp, right? My husband was in the military. Oh, okay. Oh, but the, yeah, there's boot camp in the military. And I watched some special, like the SEALs, the things they go through for training, and some of the special forces. Or you, uh, your, your dear friend, uh, Stephanie, is special forces guy. I mean, I tell you, they went through a lot of training. They, they learned to be overcomers. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been at a lot of training these 60 years of ministry. <laughs> Joyce, you're laughing a little bit. We've been in training, huh? Hello, and we've what? We've learned to what? Overcome. Praise the Lord. It says, count it all joy when you fall into all kinds of trials. Oh, boy, huh? We can take that verse out of the Bible as far as... No, count it all joy. When you fall into all kinds of trials, knowing that the trying of your faith worketh patience, and let patience have its perfecting work, so that you might be perfect, mature is the word, and entire, wanting nothing. You'll be so confident in the power of God when the millennium comes, you'll just step right in. It'll be like another day at the ranch. Really? When Jesus Christ comes back to take us, we're going to say, well, it's about time. Now let's go do it. And you're going to be a part of an incredible battle. I stood in the, uh, above the Valley of Megiddo when I was over there. 
I actually bought that ring, I don't know if you remember my little lion ring, which I lost. I know. It was pure silver. It was a good ring, too. I bought that on the Mount of Megiddo, right there besides the Valley of Megiddo. That huge valley where this final battle is, as far as you can see, is this valley. And Alexander the Great fought there. Some of the great war, war, uh, uh, warfare of the world has happened there. It's going to be the, the zone where the final battle happens, where the final transition takes place. How long did it take Joshua to conquer the land? How long did it take David to conquer the land? Five years after Saul lost a lot of territory to the Philistines, it took David five more years to bring it back under the kingship of, of God. Of God. So, and by the way, he used wor worship as a form of warfare. So, uh, we're going to be a part of conquering this earth with our leader. Isn't that going to be fun, Jill? Just walk around with your violin, play it, and I'll have my keyboard on a roller or something, and we'll, we'll just worship as we go. We'll do something. We'll carol, we'll dance. We'll just do, we'll, we're going to take possession of planet earth with Jesus. We've been trying to do that with our evangelism, and we've tried so many things. And I know God needs to help us with 144,000 or we need to help them one way or another. We need to get this job done. But it is going to be finished. What does it say? Go back to Revelation 10 again. I want to read this verse for the third time. I'm doing it on purpose. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished. It's over. It's over. And by the way, it's the word days. Did you see that plural? Verse 7. But in the days of the sound of the seventh trumpet. It's not one blowing and it's all over. The days, I believe, is a period of time we're going to enter into where we transition the earth over to the rulership of Jesus. It's going to take days to do that. Just look at like it took time for Israel to uh, prepare to leave Egypt. So we have the mystery of God is completed. Finally, the manifestation of Christ's triumph is declared. Finally, we have the transition. Go, go over Revelation chapter uh, 11. Now the three woes that were announced are the last three trumpets. The three woes that were, were announced, these are terrible times of judgments that, that are coming to the earth. We saw the loosing of the scorpion demons, remember? Keys were given to that angel that descended, and or the star, which I believe is Satan. The keys are given to Satan to loose those scorpion demons on this earth. There's some really serious judgment coming in these last three. And so the angel that flew across the heavens called them the last three woes. It said the last three trumpets would be woes upon the earth. So we see the woes that happen. Now the, the final of all those is the seventh trumpet. Now we have Revelation chapter 9, 10, and 11 between the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet. So there's a long period here of things that we're going to look at those next week. What happens? What about the two witnesses? What about the rebuilding of the temple? What about some of these things? We're going to look at that next week. What happens in this interim period? These are literal witnesses that are coming to this earth. God's going to release two witnesses that can breathe fire on this earth. <laughs> these are going to be mighty men. They're going to be killed and left on the streets of Jerusalem. This is literal. You say, oh, it's all figurative. No. Listen, when you read the book of Revelation, the literal interpretation begins the start of it. And then from there, if it's clearly symbolic or allegory, then God explains that. But I believe these are two witnesses coming to planet Earth. They're going to be witnessing to Israel. God's reenacting a lot of things in Israel. Part of the restoration of all things is what God is doing in Israel. It's found in Romans chapter 8. And we're a part of that. That's so exciting. Now let's look at it, verse 15. And then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, 
and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sat before, uh, before God on their thrones fell on their faces, worship God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is, the one who was, and the one who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. Doesn't that sound good? Does that sound like music to your ears? And the nations were angry. Now, see, this is part of the transition. Go back to Psalms chapter 2 for a moment, and then we're going to tie this up. Go to Psalms 2 for a moment. Because this is exactly what David described in Psalms chapter 2. Why do the nations rage? Why do they imagine a vain thing? <laughs> the kings of the earth take knowledge and counsel together against the Lord. See, there'll be an organized effort by the Antichrist and the wicked nations to not let Jesus take control. I love Psalms 2, one of my favorite. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, saying to his anointed, let us break their bands to pieces and cast away their cords from us. Now look at God's response. Uh, don't you like this? He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. Hello. What a feeble effort of the Antichrist and all these wicked nations counseling together to stop Jesus taking over this planet Earth. Come on. God's going to laugh at that. Let's continue there. I love it. The Lord shall hold them in derision. And he shall speak to them in his wrath and in distress them in his deep displeasure. I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. Hello? Jesus' rulership is established. I will declare a decree. And the Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you and ask of me and I will give you the nations as your inheritance. The ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them in pieces with a rod of iron and shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. <laughs> Therefore, be wise, O kings, be instructed, judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry and you perish in your way when his wrath is kindled but a little. A little. Blessed are those who put their trust in him. This is the final dividing of the sheep and goat nations. This is the last stage of Jesus taking control of this earth. Now, some nations are going to immediately bow to Jesus. They're called the sheep nations. The end of the millennium. So there is going to be, there are, not everybody's going to bow to the Antichrist. Come on. There's a whole, whole group of people on earth that are going to inherit the millennium. It's going to be beautiful to be here during the millennium. Amen. We're going to rule with him. We're going to reign with him. We're going to possess these cities, these, today what, they're 232 nations. We'll be reigning and ruling with Christ under his rulership, under his, uh, he's going to rule with a rod of iron, which means he's not going to allow any, any rebellion. <laughs> he's going to put anything down immediately that comes up against his rulership. Satan will be bound for a thousand years in hell. So we see a beautiful move of God. Wow. Is this exciting stuff? Anybody else get a little excited?